right, Wednesday night, Revelation Road. <coughs> Excuse me, I hope you've been enjoying <coughs> Revelation Road, man. I, I, I've been enjoying, uh, enjoyed teaching this, and um, it's, it's just going to get better and better uh, as we dive into these truths. And so I'm going to go uh, kind of a recap. I do want to let you know, last time was part 13. I think I said 14 or something. I got ahead of myself. So some people don't take notes and some people like to have, what part is it? And some people just like, it don't matter, just keep teaching it. So uh, maybe I'll just stop saying parts. But uh, last time it was part 13. So I got that right. All right, so we've been talking about the book of Revelation. And during this time of Revelation Road last year, it's kind of weird saying that, isn't it? Last year. By the way, Christmas is not far away. I told that to Jennifer like on New Year's Day. I said, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to find out how many more days it is and I'm going to tell everybody it's only so more. You know, because it's, it's, it's weird. I know, when we were growing up, remember Christmas seemed so far away? Now it's just like, hey man, 11 more months or whatever it is and boop, you'll be buying presents again. The bad thing is you haven't paid off the last ones you just bought. Somebody say, oh me, oh me. All right, so uh, we, we were talking about, you know, understanding the, the, the rapture and, and, and knocking down some golden calves. And of course, we're going to do that as we go further into the book of Revelation because there is so much out there. There's so much teaching out there that's just, it's just crazy. It's just uh, goofy, if you will. And we're going to have to hit them on the Revelation Road, okay? And, uh, and just that's going to be roadkill. Can we call it that? We're just going to do some roadkill and get rid of some of these things because we got to get it, <clears throat> we got to get it out of our minds. We got to get it out of our, our thought patterns because it really messes us up. Okay, so a little bit of information from last time, the Book of Revelation. It is uh, not the revelation of. Or to John. It's not the revelation of John or to John. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that. When you come to the understanding in the book of Revelation that it's all about Jesus, <clears throat> then when you begin to study it, it gives you a better understanding and illumination because now you are you're leaving it from a historical, grammatical. Uh, theological, uh, sometimes boring view and hard to understand view to a relational view. You begin to see that it's about the Lord Jesus Christ and if it's about the Lord Jesus Christ, then guess what? The Holy Spirit's gonna illuminate you and give you wisdom and help you see things you didn't see before, okay? And so that's what I really wanted to, to convey last time uh, that the book of Revelation is, is a book about Jesus Christ. And he wants you and I to know about him. He wants you and I to experience him, okay? And, and again, it's not about the, the 144,000 and all this other stuff that's going on out there, really cultish Christianity views. Uh, listen, the book of Revelation is not really even a book about scaring you. Step over here. The book of Revelation is not about fear, not for the godly. There are fearful things, absolutely, and we're going to go through all of them. We're going to go, the Lord willing, we're going to go line upon line, precept upon precept. We're just going to pull words apart, and we're going to look at this whole thing. But, but at the end of the day, it's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about the homecoming and home going. It's about so many great things. And so that's the way I teach the book of Revelation. I mean, again, we can, we can walk out of here with white knuckles and be fearful, but, but at the end of the day, I don't believe anything in the Bible is to make us as believers fearful. It's to make us faithful. It's to make us full of hope. It's to make us have expectancy. And so it depends on how you read it. And, and that's why I, I don't like sitting under teachers uh, who, who, who use the book of Revelation as a manipulative tool, manipulate people into, into being fearful. God never desires for us to ever worship him out of fear. Let me try that again. He wants us to worship him out of love. 
the fear of who he is, yes, reverence, but not the fear he's going to squash you. I don't think that's a good relationship, do you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do very good in marriage if you're fearful of your spouse. Maybe the mother-in-law, but not the spouse. Okay, so it's the 66th book of the Bible. Uh, 66 is interesting because it deals with idolatry and idol worship, and we'll get into that later on because we'll see it, uh, that it's in there. Uh, some historical facts. It was written in 96 AD or AD 96 by the apostle John, who, by the way, was boiled alive in oil. Yay! How many of you all want to be an apostle? Uh, but anyways, it happened, and, uh, but he lived. He lived. I don't know what was worse, being boiled on it and, <laughs> or, or living. And, of course, the Roman emperor at the time uh, banished him, sent him, hated him, so he sent him off to Patmos, uh, as, as some pronounce it differently, Patmos, which is about 50 miles off of Turkey. And it was not Club Med, and it wasn't like any of our federal penitentiaries or state penitentiaries we have today. This was a very rocky, very uh, rigid type of place. But what a place to receive revelation of the last days. All right? He was a part of the triclinium. Remember I talked to you about that last time, Matthew 17. Keep that in mind, the triclinium, and the fact that he was there with Peter, Peter and James uh, during the Mount Transfiguration because it plays into the whole understanding of the book of Revelation, okay? The triclinium represents three. They were the three closest to the Lord Jesus. And always remember in life, you'll have people that are very close to you in proximity, and then it goes on and on and on outward into the masses, into society, into people, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but so that's why you have to be careful because who's closest to you Watch this. Who's closest to you know the intimate things about you. It amazes me that people that share their whole life with everybody outside of the triclinium. In other words, there's some things in your life that ain't nobody's business but who God puts in your life close to you. And you have to guard your heart. Okay? All right. So what else did I give you? To see. Uh, the church by this time was, uh, was alive, if you will, functioning for about 60 years. And that was just a little bit of historic information. So we began in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation was given to Jesus about the end times. So let's look at that real quick. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him wasn't unto John, it was first to Jesus to show unto his servants, everybody say slaves, slaves, things that which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So my first statements last time we got together was that the revelation was given to Jesus about the end times. And again, the word servants there translates into slaves. Uh, John didn't have any servants, so we know it was the Lord Jesus. But there's something extra that I wanted you to see is that uh, it, it deals with Jesus' assignment. Jesus has an assignment. And, and this is a continuation of the Bible. The book of Revelation is not an add-on. You know, God didn't have anything else to say, so he added it on. No, it's the continuation of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God gave him that revelation and said, hey, this is, this is your assignment. This is what's going to happen in the end times. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you and I enough that he shares his assignment? <clears throat> See, that's why I believe the church is not raptured out like many say, because he showed me his assignment and his assignment is my assignment yes. as the church. The church and, and, and Jesus are one. We function and, and live and move and have our being in him. Now, obviously, we don't do exactly what he's going to do, but we do the mirror reflection of him. 
He told us that in, in his life and his ministry on the earth that we would do greater works, that we would walk in his, his precepts, we would walk in the things that he did and, uh, and the church would be his extension. That's why, again, I, we're not out of here and I surely don't believe I'm gonna sit at home watching the end times on a plasma TV while the world goes to hell in the handbasket. I'm going to be moving in the things of God. You're going to be moving in the things of God. We're going to be laying hands on the sick. We're going to be ministering no matter what it is. Just like those pictures we threw up there with Cuba. One of the reasons I wanted you guys to see it, not only because they're beautiful, but the fact there they are in a pandemic. They're in the worst economic times that island probably has faced in a long, long, long time. And what are they doing? They're giving. They're ministering. And then we look at ourselves and, and a lot of contrast, what do we do? A lot of people are hiding. A lot of people aren't sharing the gospel because they're too afraid. Okay, so uh, the word revelation there, I gave that to you. Uh, Apocalypse, it's kind of a hard word to say. I've already spelled it out, but I'll give you the Greek 602 if you're gonna look it up. Apocalyptus, which means to unveil or to uncover and to reveal. It's an uncovering of the assignment. It's the uncovering of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So we're gonna be looking at the unveiling of mysteries of coming events and that of the person of Jesus Christ. When I went back over my notes today and I looked at that, I highlighted that the person of Jesus Christ we get to see Jesus in a light we never saw before. You don't see him in the four gospels this way. When it comes to the book of Revelation, you get to see him as Lord of all lords. You get to see him as king of kings. You get to see him with his eyes full of fire and the passion he has. You get to see him in his majesty. Whoo, glory to God. Uh, you, you may see him beaten in the Gospels. You see him being whipped. You see his beard being plucked out. You see him being crucified. You see him being embarrassed and put shame upon him and all those different things. And he raises from the dead, hallelujah. But then we get to see him in his majesty seated on the right hand of God. Woo, hallelujah. That's my king. I said, that's my king. That's my risen savior. That's your risen savior. So it's a revelation, an unveiling of Jesus Christ. We never get to see him this way in the gospels. He talks about where he came from, you know, uh, the Mount Transfiguration and we saw some glorious things and his miracle working power and the blinded eyes open and the the deaf ears unstopped and the lame walked again and the dead were raised. I mean, we saw the miracles, but now we see the majesty. You saw the miracles in the gospels, but now you see the majesty, the authority, the power and dominion of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Absolutely, it's awesome. So in our beginning teaching, as a template, as a foundation for us when we teach this, we come at it this way. I'm not going into this book fearful. I'm going into this book with expectation. I'm going into this book expecting to see what my Savior looks like in the last days. And guess what? On that journey, we're going to see what we look like too because we get to be a part of it, okay? It also means disclosure of the truth. That word, 602, it means the disclosure of the truth. Why is that important? Well, because the truth is who? Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And also in the book of Revelation, it puts to bed all the lies, all the deception, all the false teachings, the things that Paul had to deal with, you know, people saying that Jesus had already come, the end times have already started, all these different things he dealt with. Uh, when you see the revelation of God and the revelation of Jesus and his assignment and the plan of God, you begin to see the truth. And that's why we need to teach this. We need to see the truth. Because <clears throat> as I said earlier, 
there is so much stuff out there today that is, is just false, absolute false, and it's putting the church in panic. It's putting the church in crisis mode. It's putting the church at, at unnecessary liability of life. And that's not what God wants us to do. So that revelation is going to bring us truth. John 5, 19, you don't have to go there. Uh, God gave Jesus his assignment. He only did what he was told to do. He only did what he saw the Father do. Again, this is the beginning of revelation. The revelation that God gave to his son, Jesus Christ. And then Jesus begins to fulfill it. Remember John 15, 5, we can't do anything without him. Is that right? How do I know what I'm supposed to do in the last days if I don't read the book of Revelation and see my assignment too? Well, we're not in there, but yes, we are in there. Yes, we are in there. And this is the problem with the whole pre-tribulation rapture theology and doctrine. It pulls you out of the book of Revelation. It pulls you out of the end times and it pulls you out of your assignment. And that's why people don't give a rip. Most Christians in pre-tribulation type of church doctrine, uh, you know, in theology, they're not people of of passion towards the end times because who gives a rip? I'm out of here. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever. It doesn't make a difference to me. And and again, then they become out of tune and out of time with God and they're gonna miss it and they're gonna play catch up in the last days. You're not because you have the truth, the truth right here called the Bible. Isn't that good? I don't wanna play catch up. Look, we have friends and family right now, I know you all do, that are wondering, what's going on? What's happening? Come on, look at me go like that. What's, what's going on? You, uh, your pastor was right. Or, or whatever they say. You know, you were right. Or wh- whatever they say. And, and they're, they're catching up. But you know how they're catching up? By fear. They're catching up by panic. Now they're running. You ever try to catch a bus? Come on, city folk. You know, <laughs> you ever catch a bus? That's the worst feeling ever to miss a bus. Because that guy don't look back. He just goes, man. He just goes. He ain't worried about your money. He's already getting paid, you know. Uh, And that's what people do. They're playing catch-up. And when you play catch-up, you have to run. You get in a hurry. You panic. You drop things. You're not ready. Well, we're not going to be that way. All right? So the book of Revelation was designed to study and not to freak us out. (laughs) Isn't that good? It's, It's designed for us to study and learn the blueprint of what's happening. So I gave you the word servants. I'm not going to go back over that, but that was 1401, which represented slaves. Listen to the defi- definition one more time. <clears throat> By the way, I'm giving you free stuff I didn't give you last time, so uh, going over it is, is worth your time. One who gives himself up to another's will, those whose service is used by Christ in extending and advancing his calls among men, devoted to another, to the disregard of one's own interest. So the revelation of the last days comes to those folks who are not interested in what's going on in their world particularly. They're interested in what's happening in the Lord's world, in his kingdom. They're interested in what's happening in the last days. So as a slave, I'm not worried about my stuff. Let me try that again. I'm not worried about my stuff. I'm not worried about what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen to my stuff? Uh, It's going to burn up. It's going to be gone. Uh, Your treasure's in heaven. Who cares about your stuff? Do you realize your box they put you in is only so big? You might get a teddy bear in there. You still ain't taking it with you. Somebody going to take it when you go and they, everybody leaves that room. Somebody going to grab it. Come on, folks. Y'all ain't helping me. And we don't think that way. We just think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to grab a hold of everything I can. You got to learn how to lo- live loosely. You have to live like a slave and have all of your interests in God. Why am I saying that? Because to truly understand the book of Revelation, you have to have the abandonment of self, of fear, of worry. Oh, what's going to happen? No, Lord, I'm yours. 
Whether I live or I'm die, I die, I'm yours. It doesn't matter. I'm yours. You love me with an amazing love. So why should I fear? Pretty good, huh? We don't, but we don't look at it that way. We don't look at it that way because we don't look at it that way in life. We try to hold on to things. All right, this book is not for casual Christianity. I'm going to blow some people away. It's about intimacy. There are intimate things that are spoken here. Again, it is given out of a love relationship. It is a book. It is a letter in certain forms to us, a diagram, a template. And when you love somebody, you share intimate details, okay? And we'll get into that in a minute. Okay, the word uh, shortly, it was back up there on the screen, uh, shortly, shall shortly come to pass, uh, tacos, tachometer is what they call it, tachometer is what I always called it, but the, the RPMs in your car, okay? And so uh, it, it represents speed. The next word was speedily. With quickness, once it starts, it will quickly come to pass. <clears throat> Let me say this to you. Uh, I believe that in the precursor events of the last days, like right now, things are moving fast, but in one sense, they seem to drag on too. When these events take place, it won't be that way. In other words, when I start teaching the book of Revelation, and Jennifer brought this up to me one time, she's like, man, there's so much that has to happen in that seven years. And you think about it from the carnal, linear type of view of seven years. But in the book of Revelation, the things are to be happening with such consistency and such speed, seven years will be a, a blur. Does that make sense? It won't, it, won't, it won't matter time because so much will be happening to us and so many things will be happening through us and it will be an exciting time. I know that doesn't really make sense or sound uh, too palatable because you're like, dude, there's a lot of terrible things. Absolutely. But God has a way of preserving men through crisis and through time. Just think of your life for a second and, and, and for a moment meditate on what seven years ago was to you. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Uh, we talk about all the time and how long we've been out of uh, Bible colleges together. I'm like, what? You're that old? What? What, really? You know, she's like, yeah, honey, we've been living in another house. You know, I don't know how many years you told me one time. I was like, I have? Flo, you ever done that? You don't do that. I do that. I, I just go, what? I can't believe. Uh, she told me it was in this building how many years? We've been five years in this building. Can you believe that? I remember watching you paint. <laughs> About to fall out. I mean, no. Sarah was helping you. Remember that? We're going to start our own company. I remember driving up here and seeing Mr. Billy Hart and all of us walking in here and, and telling him, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> we all had lint in our pocket. <laughs> didn't we you know what I mean that five, you know what I'm talking about five years ago so so it's 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 going to be an amazing time all right so if you're keeping score now we're at part 14 okay we're at part 14 so one of the things I wanted to tell you was divine order so go back to revelation chapter 1 verse 1 if you would and we'll finish that up see this is going to take a while Last time I taught this, uh, taught this, it took about 10 months. So we'll see what happens. All right, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants, that's me, that's you, slaves, which must shortly come to pass, and he signified it, or he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servants. The one thing I wanted you to see was the divine order. God to Jesus Christ to his servants, okay? Do you see that? He sent and he signified by his angels to his servants 
John. So we know it came to John. So from God to Jesus, Jesus to his angel, and really to John to the church. If you're going to do a divine order, that's how it would come down. Okay? Now the word sent, and he sent. Here's the word. It's the Greek word, uh, 649. 649. Apostotelo, apostotelo, which is A-P-O-S-T-E-L-L-O, A-P-O-S-T-E-L-L-O, apostotelo, which is translated to the word apostle. Now, someday I'm going to do a teaching. I've done some teaching here over the years about apostles and what they are. There's a lot of misnomers about the apostolic calling, the office of an apostle, but that's not for tonight. But what it means is, is that Jesus sent his revelation apostolically via the angel to John to the church. Now, when you, when you say apostolically, you're thinking of no makeup, no makeup, long hair, long dress, apostolic church or whatever, or some guy that's a, you know, he's, he's in a robe or, or whatever. You know, we have so mis, many misnomers of what apostolic is. The true meaning of apostolic is one that is sent before a king to make way for him. He is a, he's a one that goes uh, into the highways and he clears off all the obstacles and the rocks and the enemies and anything else to make way. What did the apostle, or what did, excuse me, John the Baptist do? He apostolically made a way for Jesus Christ. He said, here comes the king. He prepared a way, he was a messenger where? In the wilderness, making a way for the king. And so what Jesus is telling us in the beginning of Revelation chapter one, that this message will be apostolic. That's why I know I have a job and you have a job in these last days. And that is to apostolically prepare the world for the coming of the king. Whoo, glory to God. Didn't say we're all apostles. That deals with the fivefold ministry in which I'm gonna get into another time. But we all should walk apostolically. We should all walk with that authority and that dominion to make a way for the king. And one of the ways to make a way for the king is to get rid of error and lies about your king. Come on, somebody. So apostolically means making a way for the king, not escaping. <clears throat> How do I make a way for the king if I've escaped? How do I make a way for the king in the last days if I'm out of here? See, it doesn't fit with even the beginning of the theme. Remember, the first words that somebody's trying to articulate to you is a theme carrier. It carries a theme, doesn't it not? If you sit down and talk to somebody and they talk to you with this tone of voice, you know where we're headed. Flo does that to me sometimes. I mean, I know... I'm just picking on her tonight. She's, the, she's pickable tonight. Uh, no, seriously. You, 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 you're like, I know Sarah knows. Sarah picks up. She's like, oh, okay. I see how you're going to talk to me now. You know, and you can pick that up. We're not dumb. It's, it's discernment. Well, he begins it by, by giving this revelation, this assignment. And he carries on that theme throughout. It's a revelation. It's an intimate revelation. It's the truth. And he says, I'm going to pass it on to you so you can apostolically prepare the way of the Lord. All right, you like that? That's the truth. So again, if I'm escaping, then what's the use? Why are you here? Why am I here? Why are we going to go through the stuff we're going to go through if all we're going to do is just blast out? No, we got work to do. So go on back up there for me, Joshua. By the way, Josh was doing a good job on the, on the scriptures. Good job, man. Just don't mess up. All right. <clears throat> and he sent, what, apostolically, and he signified by his angel. Now, the word signify, you ready for this, is evidential. 
signified or as evidence, evidential. It means to make known. You can go in your concordance and get the definition or the, the Greek word off that, or Greek number, or I can give it to you next time I see you. But it's to make known using evidence. Let me, let me say it this way. He said, look, John, you're going to receive this revelation. I'm going to give you evidence by my angel to you, and you're going to take it to the church. You're going to take it to the slaves. You're going to take it to the servants. But I'm going to give you overwhelming facts, overwhelming truth, and overwhelming evidence so you and I are not guessing. That's why when people teach us the book of Revelation or teach us anything in Scripture, you better back it up with evidence. I don't want your opinion. I don't, I don't want what someone else thought of 20, 30 years ago or what have you. I want line upon line, precept upon precept. You show me where it fits and where you don't understand, tell me you don't understand, where it doesn't make sense, that's fine too. <clears throat> but don't try to cram stuff in there and say, well, this is what I believe it is. Okay, I, I can handle a little bit of you saying, this is what I think it may be. But you got to watch out for them cats that are absolute dogmatic and say, well, hey, man, this is the way it is, my way or the highway. Well, you better back it up with some more scripture so that I have evidence. But the other point is, is that it is, it is evidential. In other words, the angel is going to back up what he's going to show John with evidence and with truth. And we do the same apostolically. We bring forth truth. We bring forth evidence, okay? Now, here's a, here's a very interesting part to the scripture I wanted you to see. So, uh, right here, when he finished, and he sent and signified it by his angel, okay? So, he gave him evidence unto his servant, John. Now, here's, what, here's the, the cool little tidbit I want to give you. John means Jehovah <clears throat> is a graceful giver. The name John means Jehovah is a graceful giver. Now, when you study this, uh, the book of Revelation, you're like, well, why John? <clears throat> why couldn't it be Peter? I mean, Peter cut the dude's ear off. Peter seems like to be one of the best guys to rumble in the book of Revelation, don't you? He ain't afraid of nobody. Uh, it could have been, why, why not Paul? Well, there's some, there's some interesting facts here that I want to bring out to you. Why I believe God picked John. And remember, you begin by def defining his name. That Jehovah is a graceful giver. Go to uh, John chapter 21, verse 20. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of verses here. Have you ever wondered that? Why John? I have. I mean, why, why, why the Apostle John, you know? One of the reasons, again, he was part of the triclinium, right? Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following. Well, that's pretty arrogant, don't you think? Y'all there? Whom Jesus loved. Did you know, actually, uh, that was a nickname? whom Jesus loved. Yeah, John wasn't being prideful. It was just a type, type of a nickname, a type of identification of John, whom Jesus loved. And John wrote that in there. He wasn't being arrogant, but he was, he was, making, he was making a statement. He was making a point. You ever notice that? Whom Jesus loved following which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? But look at, no, going back. We're going to stay there for a second. Then Peter, turning about, seeing the, see the disciples whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper. Out of all the dudes, out of everybody in there, the apostles, disciples, what have you, John was the one that had his head on the breast of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? 
I think that's why he received the revelation, the intimate details of the last days from the Lord Jesus Christ because of his love towards Jesus in his close proximity. Now that's a historical fact, but how does that apply to us? Here it is. Remember, this is the theme. We're beginning the theme. This is the foundation. If we're gonna build a house, we gotta have a cornerstone. It all starts with the cornerstone. If we don't build it right there, we mess up the house. <laughs> Any of us that ever build anything, you gotta be plumb. And so in the beginning of the book of Revelation, we see it is a book of intimacy because he used the most intimate person to receive the revelation. The most intimate person of all the universe is Jesus and God the Father. But then he gave it to someone who in scripture showed the most intimate feelings towards the Lord Jesus Christ. All the disciples loved him, no doubt about it. But we get the picture of this man's love for the Lord right here. And I believe that's why the Lord gave him. If you have other examples or other uh, candidates, that's fine. I, all I can tell you is it's been written, and this is the guy. John 13, 23, would you go there real quick? <clears throat> Excuse me. John 13, 23. Jesus, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. Go to verse uh, th- uh, 23. What'd you do, three? I did say three? I'm sorry, I meant 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. That was a good scripture anyways too, wasn't it? One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Again, not, not, not arrogance, just a term of affection, just a, just a type of nickname uh, whom Jesus loved, okay? Now go to John chapter 19, 20, 26 through 27. John chapter 19, 26 through 27. Let's look at another account, okay? Now this is from Jesus' perspective. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved. (laughs) Gee, John. Well, it's his book, right? John wrote the book. I guess he can say what he wants to say. Whom he loved. I'm going to stop for a second. Think about that. That's pretty heavy. That's how John felt. John understood the relationship between him and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that none of the others got it. I'm not saying they didn't get it. Just to John, he's like, I'm the one he loved. Shouldn't we have that mentality sometimes? They always tell us growing up, if, if, if you're the only person on the earth, Jesus would have died just for you. Well, we believe that. That's true. I believe that. Why don't we live that? John did. Whew, glory to God. Standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciples, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. What happened there? It's kind of like an adoption just took place. There was something about John that Jesus loved, but more than that, because he loved everybody the same, there was something about the loyalty of John that caused Jesus to trust him with his own mother. That's powerful. Well, he was God and he was just disconnected. No, no. He had the feelings that we do. He had emotions He had the capacity to cry. He had the capacity to bleed. He had the capacity to die. He had the capacity of all these emotions. But he knew John could be trusted with the most intimate thing of his earthly life, which was mama. So if Jesus could trust John with his mom, he could trust him with the intimate message of the end times. 
what, what, what is, how does that fit for you and I? It fits very easy because it means that in the beginning of reading this and studying it, if I come at it with intimacy, humility, and worship and say, Lord, I want to understand. I want to understand. I want to know the plan. I want to know what you're up to. When you begin to read it that way, instead of fearful and, or for self-gain or to show everybody you know what's happening, no, if you come at it with love, I believe you'll open your eyes to let you see things you never saw before. <clears throat> Just like John. Isn't that cool? He was the one that had his head next to the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing for you and I. You put your head near the heart of Christ, you will hear things. You will know things. There will be a revelation, a revealing, a disclosure of the truth, evidential by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm excited about that. How about you? And that's how we're going to come across this <clears throat> because that's where the secrets are. To truly understand this book, we have to get intimate with the Lord. Like John, we must put our ear upon the heart of the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me. Put up John 10, 27, if you will. <clears throat> Powerful scripture. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. How are we going to follow him into the end times if we don't know him? Well, we're just going to get in a bunker. We're going to get our Bibles. We're going to go to Walmart and get a bunch of plastic bags, and we're going to fill them up. You may survive for a while, but I don't think you'll make it to the end. Not without the plan, not without the understanding of what the Lord has prepared for us. All right, so let's go to verse two. How much time I got? Oh, I got plenty of time. <clears throat> let's go to verse two. We made it through verse one. That's how it's gonna be <laughs> from here. Judah's like, oh my gosh, bro. But it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a blast. All right, so where are we at? Verse two. So let's break this down. So the revelation... It's from the Father to the Son, to the angel, to John, to the church. It says, who bear, and I'll read the whole thing out, bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Okay, so let's break down the first word, bear. That's Greek 3140. And I'll spell it for you. M-A-R, M-A-R, T-U-R-E-O, M-A-R, T-U-R-E-O, got it? It's 3140, and it comes from the root word being a martyr, Okay? It means to be a, a witness or to bear witness giving evidence. Okay? Here's what I want you to write next to your notes there. In, in the last days, in the study of the book of Revelation, as we get this information downloaded in our spirit, as we come to understanding we become bearers, carriers of the evidence. Hmm. What well, I don't understand what's happening right now in our nation. I don't understand what's happening in our world. Here's the evidence right here, the Bible. Let me show you in the book of Revelation or let me show you about end time prophecies the things that Paul said and Timothy and so on and so forth <clears throat> of what would take place in the last days. Here it is, boom. It's in your headlines, but it was here first, okay? So it means to be a witness. Now, the, the, the root word 
again, comes from being a martyr. To be a witness is to be a martyr, okay? But it's to bring that evidence to bear that testimony. And so, who bear record, so he carried it, had the revelation, the testimony, the evidence of the word of God. Now, that word <clears throat> is 3056, and that spelling is L-O-G-O-S, logos. Some say lagos, logos. The logos, which is the written word of God. But listen to this definition because it really changes the understanding of this. Logos, a word, not in the grammatical sense of a mere name, but a word as embodying a conception or ideal. I know that's a lot to say, and I'll, I'll try to say it one more time. But you'll just have to get the CD. A word, not in the grammatical sense of a mere name. Word. Just throwing out a name, throwing out a word. But a word as embodying a conception or ideal. In other words, it's the power of the truth of that word. It's what the word represents. It, it, if I'm unlearned of the Bible and I'm unlearned in relationship with God and I just say Jesus, well, Jesus can be Jesus, it can be just a name. There's no power in just saying Jesus. But if I know who Jesus is and I know the power of that name and I use that name in its full authority, that changes everything. So the evidence who bear record of the power of the word of God, the evidence of that name, the evidence of the logos of God, the ideal or the concept so what he's going to reveal to us is not just mere words. They're not just mere historical facts. And I have to say that because a lot of our theologians, especially those in the cemetery, I mean the seminary, and a lot of your Bibles that you all have that are watching right now, your commentaries, they look at a lot of things in the historical precept, concept, mindset. And when you do that, then you dilute the power of what God is saying. Even though there's tinges and there's shadows of historical truth, which I'll show you, if I totally gloss over everything historically, I lose the power of what God is saying for my today. You're going to have to rewind that to catch what I said. But it's the truth. And that's why we have to be very careful because religion, theology, can be so rigid. And you never really learn because you didn't make this a book of intimacy. Whether it's Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, you didn't make it a book of, of intimacy. It's just all hard facts to you, historical things. <clears throat> we proved that in Deuteronomy. That ain't true. A lot of great things in Deuteronomy, wasn't there? Okay, so it's a logos. It's, it's the power of the truth in that word. Remember, in the name of Jesus, guess what? This is just not the name of a person. In the name of Jesus, there's healing. In the name of Jesus, there's deliverance. In the name of Jesus, there's eternity. In the name of Jesus, there's salvation. In the name of Jesus, there's deliverance. We could go on and on and on. In his name is eternity. So the logos, he bear the evidence of the power of the ideal of that word. Man, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That's why these churches kill us all the time. It's nothing but just letter. 
don't do this, don't do that, don't eat bugs and don't eat bats. Y'all don't watch Veggie Tales, do you? You need some grandchildren or some children. Don't eat bugs, don't eat bats. Da, da. <laughs> I remember, what, was that Jonah? Yeah, that was Jonah. What a great, you got to watch Jonah. What a great Veggie Tales. All right. Somebody write to me and say, they're out the devil. I know. An asparagus, a tomato, so the devil. All right. So, <laughs> uh, go to Matthew chapter 8.8. 8. I got to get out of here. Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. <clears throat> let, let, me, let me prove that whole concept of what I just said in, in this one scripture. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. Woo. What was in that word? My servant shall be healed. All you got to do is speak that word. Do you see that? How powerful the word is. All he had to do was speak it. He, and he did. And what happened? That word traveled, went to the Saturian son, was healed. So that's one example of that what I gave you. All right, I can only do one more and then I gotta go. Let's go back to that scripture if you don't mind, please. Joshua, Revelation chapter one, verse two. <clears throat> so he bear, bore or he bare record of the word of God, the logos of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, now that word is 3141 in the Greek. <clears throat> it's in the same family as martyr, but it's M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A, martyria, M-A-R-T-U-R-I-A. It means testifying. Now, I want you to notice that, testifying. This logos, this powerful truth locked up in the book of Revelation, locked up in, the, in, in these entire words, testifies and is testifying about Jesus from now into eternity. Your words and my words will only last so long. Is that right? You may write a book and it's there or somebody remembers a speech you gave or whatever. But in eternity, the word will always be alive. Who bear, but, but watch this, who bear the record of the word of God and of the tes testimony of Jesus Christ, which is testifying. But here's, here's a definition. It means the office committed to the prophets of testifying concerning future events. The office committed to the prophets of testifying concerning future events that one testifies, in other words, testimony before a judge. So he's going to bear record. He's going to have evidential proof of the power of that word, and it will continuously testify. It will continuously prophesy. It will continuously test, uh, be tested by time itself, and it will continuously bring evidence and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ as a prophet would prophesy. Why does that matter for you and I? It matters because when we begin to teach the book of Revelation, we read the book of Revelation, we live the book of Revelation, it becomes the evidence, the prophecy, it becomes the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book is so much more than <clears throat> bad things and, and dragons and, and storms and, and on and on and on. So much more than that. And that's what this teaching is going to be about, is to, is to really, really get down there into that truth. All right, so that'll be the next time we get together. That's as far as I can go, because we're out of time. Father, thank you. 
for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I pray that our lives are changed by the truth of this word. I pray that everybody listening to me, uh, oh, Father God, uh, would just really just fall in love with you and say, show us the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're your servants. We're your slaves. We love you. We have no other interest in these last days. Our interest is not politics. Our interest is not what's going on in the stock market or even in the football field. Our interest is you and what you're doing in these last days. And we want to be a part of it. Father, thank you. Bless us. Keep us all safe. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, I love you. I will see you Sunday. Please be careful while you're out and about. In Jesus' name.